Okay, thank you. Now, I know it's after lunch and you all want to have a nice, peaceful time sleeping, but I'm afraid you're not going to be able to sleep for three reasons. One, I'm speaking in English, which may mean that you need to use more cognitive processing. Two, hopefully you will find my presentation a little controversial and thought-provoking. And three, I'm going to make you work. So, to start with making you work, I'm going to start with something that I might use with my students. I've used this with several groups of students. And it's the COGS task, and that is a COG. And the purpose of a COG is to rotate. But COGS don't normally exist by themselves. They normally go in groups. So here we have an even number of COGS. We have six COGS here. And when COGS rotate, one rotates clockwise and one next to it rotates anti-clockwise, so they all happily rotate. But when we have an odd number of COGS, seven here, they can't rotate because two of them are trying to go in the same direction. So to start with, I would like you to try to think about how to make a single chain of cogs with an odd number of cogs in it which will rotate. And to help you out, there should be a handout being distributed. It's just a little piece of paper like this, a very important handout, which has nine cogs on it. So you can do whatever you want with this piece of paper and try to make it so that the cogs rotate. If you just go like that, you will find that you have two cogs going in the same direction. It won't work. So play with your piece of paper. But when you look at it, the two cogs, two cogs together are going in the same direction. So then they will stick. They can't rotate. You must have cogs going in opposite directions next to each other. Some people have, have some people got hands. Some people, I don't know where the handouts are, but I didn't make enough, sorry, because they're difficult to make. Because <laughs> they have to be exactly the same on both sides. Has anyone got a solution? And you can't just go and make it too small because now you only have eight cogs. That's cheating. It's not an odd number of cogs. Nine, and there's nine in here. Has anyone got a solution? How many people here are engineers? How many engineers here? Engineers should find the solution quickly. Would you, I will demonstrate the solution for you. Put a twist in it. Twist in it. Put one twist in. One, put one twist in it, and then you'll see that they go in opposite. The two next to each other go in opposite directions. Yes. 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 So hold your paper like that because we're going to be doing things with this in a minute. This is a mo now what you have here is a Mobius strip. Yes? And Mobius strips are interesting shapes. Even though your original piece of paper clearly has two sides, when you make it into a Mobius strip, it only has one side. If you want, you can draw, go round it with your finger. It's a little bit difficult to do. But you will cover everything, you will cover the whole thing without repeating. You won't, there's no, only one side to this shape. So in effect, the reason you can make it is that in effect you have a chain of 18 cogs here. You're only using nine cogs, but you've made a chain of 18 cogs out of nine cogs. 
So you've done something like this. And to show you that the Mobius strip only has one side, there's a nice piece of art. I don't know if you've heard of M.C. Escher. But here, he's got a Mobius strip with some ants on it. And since I work in Bang Mot, this is a useful picture. So how many people are familiar with M.C. Escher's art? Is anyone familiar with M.C. Escher? No? Interesting. I'm sure you are actually familiar with some of his art. He's done a lot of other art. There's another thing. This is a, looks like it could be a Mobius strip. It isn't actually, but this is about perspective, whether the things are going out or going in. Then there's a whole series like this, which is tessellation. It's not very easy to see on this, sorry. But the picture and the, the, in the middle there is shapes. And it's a shape of a lizard, but together they fill up the whole plane. This is an important thing mathematically. And he did a whole series like this. And this is actually non-Euclidean geometry. And finally, he did a lot of stairs, things like this. There are some of his stairs are very famous, and you may be familiar with them, even if you don't know who M.C. Escher is. And these are actually made out of Penrose triangles. But what am I doing? I'm supposed to be talking about education. Why am I talking about art and cogs and things like that? Why would I use this sort of thing as a way of starting a class? I mean, I don't think any, even for any engineers, I don't think anyone is ever going to be required to make a Mobius strip of cogs. It doesn't have any practical value. M.C. Escher, they may be beautiful, but they have no practical value. So why would I waste time in the classroom doing things which have no practical value. But I would argue that this is helping students with thinking. You're probably playing with your piece of paper. How can I make it into a, into a shape that works? And what I think is actually more important here is curiosity. You've seen M.C. Escher you might want to go and Google images of M.C. Escher and find a lot of his other pictures if you thought they were attractive. These are things where I'm trying to stimulate students' curiosity. And this strikes me as one of our main jobs as teachers. And there's a, but there is still a problem here. In a classroom, maybe you could argue that I will waste 30% of the course time on things which are of no practical value. And the reason I'm doing this is because of my ideology. And ideologies are very important, but not considered very much. So ideologies are your whole underlying belief system that guides your decisions. A key issue is that ideologies are nearly always taken for granted. They are unconscious. People are not normally aware of what their ideologies are. They make decisions and they think things are good without really being aware of why they're making those decisions. They don't, you have lots of assumptions about education. These form your ideologies. And these are very, very important in guiding how education works. So I would like to help elicit your ideologies. But it's going to be multiple choice, sorry. But you're Thai, so you're used to multiple choice tests. So I've put up for, OK, education. What is the overriding purpose of education? And I've given you a choice of four here. Training students to be useful employees in the workplace, enabling students to learn what they want, fostering students' intellectual growth, 
or developing students' critical consciousness to change society. Now, I'm going to be mean. You are only allowed to choose one. You can't say they all sound good. You have to choose one. Now, unfortunately, we don't have clicker here, so it's going to be hand raising. And everyone must raise their hand once, but only once. So, who thinks that the, pr the primary purpose of education is number one, training students to be useful employees in the workplace? Hands up. Two or three. The lights here are really bright. I'm having problems seeing you. Who says enabling students to learn what they want to learn? Got one, two. Oh, numbers three and four must be very popular then. Because you're all going to raise your hands once. Fostering students' intellectual growth? Maybe the most common. Developing students' critical consciousness to change society? Oh, the biggest one, the biggest one. OK, I've used these, I've taken these from something called the Deering Report. It was a UK government report in the 1970s on the direction for university education in Britain. And he came up with these four primary goals, ideologies of education. And they have certain names. So we've got economic efficiency, learner-centeredness, academic rationalism, or social reconstructionism. So which one do you think guides Thai education? Which is the main one guiding Thai education? Number one? Do we, should we have another hands up? Who thinks the main guiding ideology underlying Thai education is economic efficiency? Yeah? Learner-centeredness? No one. Academic rationalism? Or social reconstructionism? OK, we'll look for some evidence on this. You listened to Dr. Krishanapong's talk this morning. How much of the time did he spend talking about the economy and developing the country and things like that? It was a very, very major central issue in his talk. And economic efficiency pretty much dominates Thai education. The most recent reform plan, two months ago, the second highest, the first highest, the national education standards. The national education standards in the preamble, I've taken the 2004 one here because I had it. Education is essential for vigorous competitiveness. Educational competitiveness. Everything comes down to, ed to the economy. It's not competitiveness in sport, it's all about economy. And if we look at some of the quotations from the Puyais of Thai education, you'll find that they always talk about the economy. I actually, in preparing this talk, I actually had about 30 or 40 quotations I could have used. But I chose just one, which was just really says everything perfectly. So here, the purpose of education is to help the economy. In effect, universities are job training centers. Do you feel happy? Do you feel happy working in a job training center? I mean, yes, we have to acknowledge we want our graduates to get jobs. We want them to be successful in life, and having money and employment is part of success in life. 
But should everything come down to the economy? Other people have made some counter-arguments. Oh, sorry, I'm out of sync here. Um, there are some problems with it. Firstly, the whole ideology of economic efficiency underlying education is pretty recent. It's only from the 1980s. And the 1980s was a time when the whole world's social order changed. In America, you had Reagan. In Britain, you had Thatcher. Yes, Britain's only a small island and not very important these days. But these people had massive impacts on the whole on internationally. They emphasized postmodern capitalism. Prior to this, everything wasn't about develop the economy. Economic development is the, end, the only goal. But with Reagan and Thatcher, that became the driving force for governments. And so we're seeing that economic efficiency comes from the change to postmodern capitalism. And another issue with economic efficiency is that it's performative. Everything is about what can be done. Not necessarily what can be learnt, but what can people do afterwards. And so everything is about what can be measured. I'm sure everyone here loves the university QA system. You all really enjoy it when your faculty is being evaluated and you have to waste three weeks of your life filling in forms and making up numbers. No. I mean, this is because of postmodern capitalism, the economic efficiency ideology. It drives measurement. But what this means is that education looks at what can be measured, not necessarily what is of value. Everywhere we hear things about ethics and morals. Ethics and morals are nearly impossible to measure. Everyone talks about ethics and morals and then forgets them. We've said, that, we've said it, so that's enough. We can move on. Because you can't measure it. You can't do a QA of ethics and morals. It's you, education, you look at what you can measure, not what's of value. There's also other issues. The whole point of economic efficiency is to get graduates employed and to drive the country's economy. But even here, it's not very clear whether this is the best model. If we look at the American engineering accreditation system, they list, I think it's nine key, key aspects which all graduate engineers should have. And they include things like this. So it often ends up with economic efficiency that people end up paying lip service to these things rather than really trying to do them because you cannot measure them. And measurement is important because everyone is driven by an ideology of economic efficiency. So is econom economic efficiency dominates Thai education. But is it the only thing? There is one document that goes against economic efficiency. And that's the most important document, supposedly, the National Education Act. And the National Education Act is pretty much learner-centeredness. If you look at the definitions of educa what, how education is defined, and it has sections about how learning should be conducted, then you'll see that the National Education Act actually promotes learner-centeredness. It's just that no one actually pays any attention to the National Education Act. It's a nice document and it makes us feel good, but we'll put it on the shelf and never look at it. So there is an alternative within Thailand. There's also been some arguments about the dominance of economic efficiency. From a social reconstructionist perspective, a group led by Feigenblatt. They were mostly Malaysians for some reason. I don't know why. But they wrote an article criticizing the way that Thai education is run from a very strong social reconstructionist perspective. And they argue that the way that Thai education is run is to benefit the rich. 
It's to get those poor people to be willing workers to make the rich richer. That's their argument. Whether you believe it or not is up to you. But this would be a social reconstructionist perspective on Thai education. And the final one, academic rationalism. I couldn't find a quotation about academic rationalism for Thailand. Sorry, I can't find any quotations which fit. So I've had to go outside Thailand here. And here, it's arguing that the economic efficiency model is very short-sighted. And it's just, it's very, you know, I want to get an education to get money. Surely we should, you should be getting more than just an opportunity to make money from an education. Surely it should be broadening your mind as well in some way. So there are counter quotations, counter arguments against economic efficiency, but economic efficiency still dominates. So I'd like to go to first roots, go to the roots of education instead and find out what is the real purpose of education. So I'm going to start as far back as I can go. Socrates, 2,500 years ago in Athens. Knowledge should be sought with a view to the beautiful and the good. This is not about measuring things. In the same sort of time period, Aristotle. Education's end is the pleasure of knowing itself. Which educational ideology does this sound like? Can you remember them? This sounds like fostering intellectual growth, academic rationalism. OK, this is 2,500 years ago. Who cares? Society has changed. The world has changed. No one cares. But if you want to choose a, a single culture that has had the greatest impact on mankind, ancient Greece is the culture you should choose. Philosophy started in ancient Greece. Science started in ancient Greece. History started in ancient Greece. Pretty much everything that we teach started as an academic subject in ancient Greece. They probably know what they're talking about. And if we're thinking that our education should have some sort of similar impact on the future, maybe we should use ancient Greece as a model. But going through the centuries, going to Charles Eliot, he was the longest president of Harvard. Education is the enthusiastic studies of subjects for the love of them, without any alternative. So we're seeing that these sort of people are arguing for academic rationalism, fostering intellectual growth. So moving to the present day, Stephen Fry, he makes an argument about whether actually directly comparing economic efficiency and academic, um, academic rationalism. He's saying academic rationalism, yes, it has a place when you're training people for a specific job, like the four, one month training before you start the job. That's economic efficiency. But for things like real education, secondary school, primary school, university, it should be academic rationalism. So if we accept academic rationalism as an ideology that should be guiding us. What does this mean? You love knowledge for the sake of it. Does this mean that you should know the latest celebrity scandal? Is that useful knowledge? What knowledge is actually worth knowing? And traditionally, we've had the traditional Western canon. You've probably heard of most of these names, and you've probably never read any of them. And this was maybe early in the 20th century, the first half of the 20th century, and education meant knowing these books. And some of them are very, very influential books. 
It is hard to find a book more influential than, say, Darwin's The Origin of the Species. But most of them are completely unreadable. They're very, very difficult to read. And perhaps most importantly, from a Thai perspective, they're all dead white European males. There's actually the term dwem, dead white European males. This is clearly, there's a cultural bias here. So maybe we shouldn't be looking at the traditional Western canon. Maybe we need to look somewhere else for what is quality knowledge. And there's a problem here. There are culture wars. You can see here we have Shakespeare's head and a teenager's body, a modern teenager's body. There are culture wars where some people say that, yes, some things are high, there's high culture, there is good culture that everyone should know. And some people say, no, everything is relative. Nothing is of any more value than anything else. So, under the high culture, we might find War and Peace, Mozart, Shakespeare, if you want films, Citizen Kane as a film. Under popular culture, we get Fifty Shades of Grey, Justin Bieber is the modern Mozart. Soap operas are the modern Shakespeare. Police Academy films, these are, are what we have is an argument between quality and relativism. And a relativist would argue that the things on the left are of equal value to the things on the right. They are the same value, the same worth. Personally, I think this is rubbish. Ten years' time, no one is going to play Justin Bieber's music. Ten years' time, people will still be playing Mozart. The popular culture tends to be very short-lived. However, this doesn't necessarily mean that we have to go back to the traditional Western canon. I believe quality exists. Some things are more of higher quality than others. But also that quality is not restricted to the high culture. There are some things in popular culture that will have a lasting effect, that do have value. And probably most importantly, compared with the traditional Western canon, quality can be accessible. If you try to read philosophers like Wittgenstein or Kierkegaard or Hume, they are completely incomprehensible. You can't understand them, you fall asleep. There is some quality literature we can give to our students. I would say, it, I'm not talking about the war and peace necessarily. Maybe the more modern classics like Animal Farm by George Orwell. It's actually a very easy read in English. And there is a Thai translation of it. Give that to the students to read. Even if you want to go to modern popular culture up now, I would say that the Game of Thrones series by George R.R. R. Martin is actually a valuable read. It's very well written and has lots of different characters conflicting. Because I don't want to be too culturally biased, I'll also include Jot Mai Jack Moon Tai. How many people have read Jot Mai Jack Moon Tai? Yes? Go and read it. It's good, isn't it? It's a good book. Excellent. Gives you great insights into uh, someone's mind. It's a brilliant book. You can, I'm not saying we need to restrict this to English. I'm just, I am more familiar with the English examples. But there are quality books in Thai as well. So literature is, though, somewhat problematic. It's very difficult. E even if we are rejecting economic efficiency, you can't measure what people learn from literature. Literature changes the person, not the knowledge necessarily. So we should be encouraging literature, but if we're looking towards more uh, traditional educational goals, maybe we should be looking more at reading quality factual books. 
there is a massive amount of popular science, for example, published, and many of these are excellent. If I'm just selecting some here. For science, I would recommend Bad Science or The Drunkard's Walk. For geography, Collapse by Jared Diamond is wonderful. Just for history, we've got the modern mind or the balancing act. Again, try not to be culturally biased. The balancing act is a modern history of Thailand. For social studies, no logo was actually fairly influential. For psychology, we can come up. There is a lot of readable, interesting, popular science books or similar books around. People don't read them. We find apparently only 4.4% of Thais read books regularly. Last year, was it with where Bangkok was the reading capital of the world? Did it have any effect? I don't think so. It's a problem. But 42% of Thais are Facebook users. Now, if we're looking at valuable knowledge, I think pretty much any book will give you more valuable knowledge than most Facebook pages. There's clearly there is a bias in Thai culture towards social media and against books. And this, I think, is a major problem because the only way you can get a real in-depth argument is through a book. A website won't give it to you. Websites are too short. A really good argument takes 200 pages to make. You only get it in books. Whereas if you're on the web, you're just surface browsing. You're bouncing across lots of different pieces of knowledge. You never get any depth. If it's a good book, you get immersed. A really good book, you look at, what, is that the time? If it's a really good book, you just don't, you really do immerse yourself in the book. The problem with the web is it's distracting. Even if you say, oh, okay, I'm going to go and work on this website, and it's a, it's a good knowledge website, but oh, ping, oh, I've got an email, oh, you, oh, that, look, that link looks interesting. Oh, I wonder where that takes me. And you end up looking at pictures of cats dancing on YouTube. It is a distraction. I would argue that a lot of the books are actually the quality that we're looking for. Whereas the web, whatever its advantages, and there are a lot of advantages, but it's primarily quantity over quality. The books are quality at there are good things about technology. I mean, Web 2 has democratized knowledge production. Everyone can publish. And that's very useful for our students, especially. Because normally, if we assign our students to write something, they write it for the teacher. The teacher's the only person to read it. It's pretty demotivating for the students. If they can publish what they write on the web, They've got hundreds of millions of readers. It's more motivating for them. It's a very good thing for in terms of student assignments, for example. But it also means that most of the web is worthless knowledge. It, there is just a massive amount of junk being produced. There is very little that's actually really high quality knowledge. More seriously, I would argue, what you find with the web is that it encourages a short attention span. How long do you normally pay, spend on a page before you go to another page or refresh? Or you normally don't spend very long. Most things on the web are maybe a paragraph long. It encourages short attention span. And the whole point of the web is to attract attention, not to give you deep thinking. Everything is about attracting attention. And 
what, about four years ago, no, oh, three years ago, St uh, Stephen Carr published a book which has had quite a bit of influence in the West, The Shallows. And he says things like this, the net seizes our attention only to scatter it. We start, we see something, we pay attention to it, but then we've lost and we're looking at something else and we're looking at something else and we never really focus. The net's cacophony of stimuli short circuits both conscious and unconscious thoughts, preventing our minds from thinking either deeply or creatively. Lots of people are arguing that we need to be promoting creative thinking but maybe the web actually stops creative thinking. And what the web diminishes is the ability to know in depth a subject for ourselves. What you find is that people know less because you don't need to know things because you can just go and look them up. And people don't have their own deep thought, deep arguments of their own, because everything needs to be presented in short attention spans. And there is substantial evidence that this changes the way your brain works. Your people's brains now are different from what they were 10 years ago because of the net. People are, it's, people are less and less likely to be thinking contemplatively. Contemplation is unfashionable. And what I find is a problem with all these things that when I hear people talk about technological innovations, yes, quite often technological innovations have a lot of benefits. But any time you innovate, you are replacing something. And what people always do, people who research technological innovation, they look at the benefits of their innovation, but they don't look at what was lost. Because you are replacing something, you must be losing something as well as gaining something. And we need to be looking at those losses as well as the gains. With the web, you're getting massive access to knowledge but it's mostly fairly surface knowledge. It's really easy to find who was the king of France in 1342. You can find facts easily. You get massive access to knowledge. Google Scholar is wonderful. It gives students opportunities to publish. You can present your ideas to people easily. And it's very, very good as a means of communicating with people. But what we're losing from all this technological change is we are losing in-depth knowledge. People are not thinking as deeply as they used to be. We are losing time. Now, when I was preparing this, I talked to one of my PhD students about what I was preparing. And he suggested that I was turning into a grumpy old man who was out of date and refusing to keep up with things. You might believe that. That's fine. But I hope that I've provoked some thoughts in you and made you think more, a bit more about what you, what's happening. What I'm arguing overall, then, at present in Thailand, economic efficiency dominates. Thing you, every, the major decisions about education are based on the economy. And yes, we need to help students find jobs, but that doesn't mean that we are just job training. We should be doing more than that. Education is more than job training. We should be, my personal <laughs> ideology and belief, I am an academic rationalist probably, I believe that fostering intellectual growth and broadening minds is a key goal in education. I believe that knowledge, we should be looking at what knowledge is of value in itself, not only what knowledge can be used for something. And we need to be wary of what we are losing from all these social and technological changes. So, 
hopefully people will be thinking about quality knowledge, stimulating curiosity, encouraging in-depth reading. I believe that we should be trying to promote these if we are to fulfill the real purposes of education. Thank you. May Sawa me Tandai Tongan Sopham and I doctor is I pumped me ha. I want to ask uh, some question and exchange the knowledge. In the morning, I think uh, many things in who are teacher in Thailand don't think about our local knowledge or our wisdom. I think it's a very important. It have to not change, but we have to go outside the university and go to learn what what the people are, what they want. What we have to serve them, but we don't want to know. But we just know what we uh, want to groom our students, what to go out and to work to industry. But we don't send our students to go to the local and make to develop our local. I think it's a very important. And after that is the nature. I think uh, in Thailand, the main point is every student want to competitive. Everything that point is examination. They want to go to exam. They want to have exam. I think uh, I go to the library. I see many students inside and go to talk about their study. But I think it's something is low, it's just like activity. They have to learn from the activity. But they don't learn. They just want I want to go to university, study, exam, but activity is it lose. And it's a very important because you want to go to work, communi communicate skill, and other life uh, interactive with the people they don't have. I think it's it's important in Thailand. They don't uh, many teacher don't say about this problem. They think I have to go to make a honor in our student. They have a good grade, but they don't have a good skill in communicate with the community. But I think it's a very important. And I want to ask a question. What, what do you think the Thai teacher have to change to, to teach the student to make it good, to make it make something, make something a beautiful thing in education in Thailand? Thank you. Thank you. Well, the, f the first point, I focused on reading it's not the only way you can get in-depth knowledge. Um, I've also, clearly, I've focused on a more international perspective because that's what I am. Yes, but I actually, I, fi I often find it more interesting to sit and chat with upcountry farmers than I do to find it to sit and chat with my colleagues. <coughs> I mean, the reason, partly the reason is, my colleagues and I, we share so much. We have so much in common. Yes, they're Thai. I'm, I'm English, but still, we have a lot of shared values, a lot of shared knowledge together. When I sit and chat with upcountry farmers, I'm learning all the time. I'm seeing different perspectives on life. I'm finding out lots of things which I didn't know before. So, yes, I think we can learn from local communities but I would stress that we should be learning from local communities who are not similar to us. We should be going to communities who are different so we can learn from them. I mean, I don't mean you go in there and say, please tell me. Just chatting to people gives you different perspectives. For the what can teachers do, encourage reading. Now, I'm going to put a Jan Bandit on the spot here and be very nasty to him. At a meeting about three years ago, Ajahn Bandit, um, you are, I, we had so, some of the points I've been making here today came up in that meeting, and I argued that we should be encouraging in-depth in reading in students. 
but I said that there isn't actually that much in Thai, available in Thai, which is really good to read. There are so many of these popular science books which haven't been translated. And I suggested that the university should contact publishers to get Thai translations of some of these books. And I sent you a list of about 20 books to translate. And nothing's happened. <laughs> so now I put a jam bandit on the spot. I mean, if books like that were, if more of these books were available in Thai, it, you would feel a lot easier promoting them to students and getting students to read them. I mean, um, the magazine Science Illustrated is pretty good start. It's, are you familiar with Science Illustrated? It's in Thai. It's, it's, it's all in Thai. It's nice, um, lots of interesting articles about science. We now have them laid out around our faculty for anyone, any student who's waiting outside an office or something like that can pick one up and have a flick through. Do things like that. Encourage curiosity. Encourage people to want to love knowledge. I would say that's the most important thing that teachers can do. Afternoon. My name is Taylor Pichiponchai, the um, president of Sukhothai Thamathirat Open University mm -hmm. or STOU. Well, um, I really appreciate your talk this afternoon, and uh, it is quite meaningful. Uh, there are certain things that I think that um, I do uh, agree is the point that you point out about the curiosity is the most important thing, and I think that that is the most tricky part that most teachers uh, just look over, and uh, we need to be aware of that. Um, the second thing is about the uh, one slide about the uh, increasing and the decreasing arrows, the, uh, with the red arrows, this one. Could you please show, thank you. Uh, this one is quite great. Um, yes, this one. Well, uh, if you say that, well, this is just my opinion, mm -hmm. and if you say that reading books, actually, I'm a, a bookworm. I like reading books since I was very young. And uh, I do agree with uh, what you have talked about. But however, uh, I would like to point out that net is not everything. But net is not comparable to books. Because the net is a tool. A book is a content. Okay? And if you say that the net is less than a book, the, valuable, the value is less than a book, I would say that that is wrong because the net can contain books. Mm -hmm. So we have the book book, the paper book. It can be scanned or the PDF as the ebook. So mm -hmm. whatever whatever a book has, the internet can have the same book. So yeah, yeah. I mean, I, obviously okay. I am simplifying for okay. one thing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so I do acknowledge that the net has great things. Yeah. But. What I'm trying to point out what we're losing the Kindle, and he was really excited about it. He threw it away after a month yeah. because it had too many books on it. Well, because no, I mean this is this is the sort of thing that the net does. You think, okay, I'm going to read this book now. Yeah. You start it, but because you have another two thousand books available, you think, oh, I wonder. I'll just have a quick look at that. He found he couldn't read a book because of all the temptations of all the other books. Yeah. And that, that is an advantage with the old paper book. Uh, that's what I was going to say I mean, next. I'm not saying that the, you can, some people do like Kindles, yeah. but there is still this danger of short attention spans and distractions, yeah. which we need. That danger doesn't happen with paper books. Yeah. I am being, trying to be somewhat controversial as well, yeah. but I think we do need to be aware of these losses. Yeah, okay. Uh, what I'm going to say is the, uh, the net can contain many books, mm -hmm. okay? So what you have on the paper book, we can also have it in the internet book, okay? And so you have a great opportunity to publish it and you can communicate more. Now on the, the other side, that about the in-depth knowledge, I think that uh, you need to uh, add the Dai Pitaka Canon. Okay. Okay. The Trai Patrai Pidok. Okay. One thing about that, that that canon teaches us is about the self-awareness. 
So you need to have to improve your self-awareness in order to have the time to contemplate. If you don't have that knowledge, then you lose on the right-hand side there. But if you have the self-awareness, you have sati and samadhi, then you can have time to contemplate whatever you want, and you can learn in-depth in knowledge, and also about the quality. So on the right-hand side can be overcome by practicing self-awareness, and that is in the Thai Pitaka, or Patrai Pidok, in the Buddhist canon, okay? And what I think more is about the evaluation. Well, you say knowledge is value of itself. That's true. However, as a teacher, how would you know that a student learned something? How would you know? He said, I know what I know. Don't ask, just get me past. Can you do that? No, because every education is the action to educate people. That means that we need to put some objective that you need to know this. I'm a medical doctor. When I finish my graduation, I need to be able to operate appendectomy, 20 cases. So if you come to see me, at least I have uh, operated 20 cases. You are the 21st, not my first, okay? So that is the medical cause you guarantee that what a medical graduate can do when he finish a medical degree. Then we need to evaluate. Evaluation is the action of value out what he knows in his head, in his hands and in his heart, or in the three domains of education, cognitive domain, psychomotor domain, and affective domain, what he knows in his head, what he can do with his hands, and also what he feel in his heart. Mm -hmm. How could we know what he know, what he can do, and what he feel? We need to evaluate, that's why we measure. That's the system is. So uh, I don't agree what you have said, that we don't need to measure. We need to, if you want to teach. But if you give it a free education, then let them learn what they want. However, at present, as a student, they need to learn how to learn. And as a teacher, we need to learn how to teach. That's it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I, I, was, not, I didn't say that we should not measure. I'm worried about the issue that under economic efficiency, it's only what is measurable is worth teaching because of this emphasis on exams, that you end up that it's, you only teach what you can measure. And that is a problem because a lot of other things are, which are immeasurable are of value as well. So I didn't say we shouldn't measure. But there are, there are still issues with evaluation about, I'm always confused about why we evaluate and who we are evaluating for. I find it a very confusing area to think through. But I think I've run out of time. <laughs> ค่ะเนื่องจากขณะนี้นะคะเวลาก็ล่วงเลยมาพอสมควรแล้วนะคะขอเสียงปรบมือนะคะเป็น Associate Professor Dr. Richard Bassan Kaur ด้วยค่